Peter, it's such a pleasure having you again. Thank you so, so much for joining us. We're honored to have you where you've become part of the soundtrack of our lives, as Sander here in our community likes to call it. And um, I want to begin just by asking maybe a few questions to warm up. And then we're ready to hear and to be uplifted and inspired <clears throat> by your songs too. Okay, so um, first of all, how's, how's this been for you, this COVID-19 era? Has it been for you in general and particularly as an artist? Well, first of all, you got to excuse me eating my peanuts and stuff. I've been a little famished. <laughs> so it's for the benefit of the performance. Um, <laughs> Good, great protein. One thing that's really nice about COVID Again, with the overarching caveat with respect to people who have actually suffered from this, who have been sick or loved ones lost. So if I get glib about it, it's not without a consciousness of that. But one good thing about it is you can clean the floors. And when you're finished, 30 seconds later, pop in and be with all your people. You know, that's a that's an advance um, yeah. um, New York in general the reason that I left Santa Monica it seemed at times uh, to be less than engaging maybe just because it just got tiresome too many hummingbirds too many palm trees too many ocean breezes <laughs> scented with jasmine can even be tiring so one thing about New York, and I, I had lived here as a young, much younger man um, in my early 20s, in the mid 80s. And I always thought to myself, um, there they are. Is that my phone ring? I'm going to mute everybody. There you go. And then I'm going to re unmute you now, Peter, so that that's it. No background noise. Go for it. I'm going on airplane mode as if I'll ever go on an airplane again. But I was just saying, no matter how frustrating it got, no matter how depressing it sometimes got, um, no matter how incredibly challenging, it was never boring. And I feel the same about it now. There are days when I literally am in the shower like weeping. You're not supposed to know about that. The people are speaking are always supposed to have it together. They're supposed to know and have a life path that insulates them from the foibles of the average person. But I will tell you, that's not the case um, with me. Uh, anything that I say is not from like some superior knowledge. It's just from hard won experience. So let's just get set that straight. Right, right. Okay, and Peter, so if I may go now a little deeper, so you, you have really accomplished a lot, uh, not just as an artist, but also as a writer, as a teacher, and as a human being, as a Jew. Um, so I, I would like to ask, who are the people that influence you the most and how so? Maybe musically and also, I would say, spiritually. I know that the Lubavitch Rebbe's 26 Yacht Site is coming up tomorrow night and Thursday, and this, he may be one of those people who influenced you the most, but maybe you can uh, give us a glimpse. Well, I mean, for sure, the person that influenced me the most was my dad. And I'm not sure everyone can say that, or maybe they save that for a Father's Day card or Hallmark card, but he really did. Um, he was a man that I, I often describe like, in my reductionist fashion, the three types of people. One, the horrible virus-like person who gets in your midst and just makes you feel awful about yourself and the world at large. Thankfully, there are not that many of them. And then there's the sort of middle person who's just parve, neither milk nor meat. And it's kind of like, well, hello, what time did you get here? Okay, goodbye, you know, like, all right, that was interesting. Not really. And then there are the people that the rarer breed, um, and we all know them and we, we adore them for the disability. They're able to 
instill in us a sense of whatever it is that we want to achieve, any good aim is possible. And they often do this wordlessly. They do this just some by some osmotic transference of idea oftentimes. Sometimes intellectual lectures, didactics, you know, talks, they don't do as much as is just observing a person in action. So my dad primarily that was one to try to and not that I achieve this, certainly not to the degree that he did, but uh, you know, trying to uplift people around you, starting with the, the core, which is your family, which is sometimes harder to do than a stranger. And that's a whole other topic. And uh, you know, have a sense of humor about things, make people feel good about themselves. And uh, I said, I suppose the second most influential person and this isn't just because I'm trying to speak uh, positively about Chabad or anything you know like should I talk about the Rebbe now you know for sure my kids and these are long stories that I will not unfold but I won't give you the headlines I'm sure my kids wouldn't have been born uh, without the Rebbe I'm sure where I, I sit today would not be because of the Rebbe um not that he gave me a whole new world view, but I think the reason I was so quickly attached to the teachings of Chabad and Hasidus is because these were ideas, and maybe we can go into some of those ideas later. Those are ideas that felt very normal to me. They felt very organic. And if the Rebbe had an influence, it was only that he kind of cleared some some dust and grease away from the window pane of my, you know, consciousness. Um, so there's not a day that goes by when maybe maybe hour to hour when I where I don't think of those two uh, men, and probably third on the list is my brother. He's four years older than I am, and that's nice to have people that close, you know. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And then musically, if I may ask. Uh, well, that's, you know, that's a little harder because there's so many influences. I mean, one of the things that my dad did, he, he was a serial entrepreneur. And he started in Minneapolis, where I'm from, the first uh, eight-track tape company, uh, if anyone remembers what those were. It was called Tape-O-Rama. Is there a better name? He had a cross-country ski business. He imported the first Japanese motorcycles when those were something that nobody would, could even reconcile. What do you mean? Little Bikes by Japan, who was notorious for making low-quality goods at that time, was in the public, you know, sort of consciousness. That rode not on the road like the stately Harley-Davidson, but on dirt. And uh, he did all sorts of things. And he brought home a lot of these 8-track tapes at the time he had that place for me when I was a kid. Not that he had any connection with Howlin' Wolf or the Rolling Stones or Janis Joplin or Jimi Hendrix. He, I'm sure he had no idea who these people were. My dad was not like a cultural maven, thank God. you know. And, uh, but he did bring me that music. And I'm like, damn, I could do this. Little did I know at the time it was... a uh, a way for me to reproduce pru or vu, to do the mitzvah of attracting a woman, but I didn't really put it in those theological terms at the time. I just thought this looks cool and I'm into it. Okay, Peter, now if I may ask yet another intense question. So you've performed across the world over decades now. Are there one or two stories, interactions, that have been etched in your memory that uh, serve maybe as a source of inspiration to you and potentially to all of us here? Well, there was one shul, I think it was in Arizona. It was uh, by this Sephardic rabbi led by him. And yeah, that was a good one. That was good. I mean, that's why I was asking the question. Thank you. We can move on to the next one. Well, which is to say, too, you know, um, I, 
I don't remember a lot of names, especially of famous people. It always like, slips my mind. I guess it did even when I was young. But I remember the, the performances pretty well. There were always moments there where this side of me, which isn't ever released like in my house, in my normal life, it's a facet of myself that comes out in front of an audience. And not that this is the performance of the year, but that person has sort of arrived, let's say 31% even right now. Maybe he'll get up to like 70 today. Who knows where it's going to go? Um, so that's probably what distinguishes those moments from, from others and makes them more memorable. There were so many things that happened on stage. One time in New York, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, I was driving to the gig with this incredible pianist. His name is David Morgan. He studied with... Uh, what was his name? He just passed away. I'll think of his name in a second. He's an incredible keyboard player. He studied in New Orleans. And we decided, or at least I did, we were driving in a cab to the gig. I saw a hardware store. I said, you know, stop. David, you wait in the car. And uh, I bought a little hot plate and a pan. You know, you can buy a bunch of kitchen things and a spatula. Then we went to a store, I got some eggs and some basil and some salt and pepper, some olive oil, I like to cook. So in the middle of the show, I just sort of set up this stage or little table and I started cooking the eggs. And the band was new, I used a jazz band, jazz musicians, because they were very flexible. And they, they learned some of my songs, but I wanted them to be able to improvise. I said, so let's, let's do an experiment. So I'm going to make these eggs, and while I'm cooking, make them sound like they're poison. And everyone knew exactly what to play. It, it was just like this great score of a horror movie. Make them sound like country eggs with good old side of bacon on the side. And they did that, too. And um, make them sound Cajun, and they were really good at that. Um, and then I had a kid in the audience. I said, is anyone hungry? He came and ate them all. I probably made a dozen of them. He ate the whole dozen. Another time after, just before the concert was about to uh, end, was in Chicago. It's probably a thousand people. I said, is anyone hungry? I'm constantly thinking of food. And they raised their hand. I said, is there a restaurant nearby? And there was, about a mile away, a restaurant called The Golden Apple. I don't know if anyone's from Chicago. To verify. So about 600 people went down the street with me at about 1030 at night. And you can understand the power and pleasure of being sort of a fascistic dictator, at least to have a group of people just marching on your command. You know, it, it can go to a person's head. But we passed police officers. And they, they were flummoxed because the crowd was so docile and sort of, you know, had a great sense of humor. And somehow they trusted that nothing bad would happen. And the group of, of hundreds convened on this restaurant. I think that one of the waitresses who was there was unnerved you know, thought this could be a dangerous thing. I explained to her, no, 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 they're just very hungry. So some of us went in and some stayed out. But, you know, there's right. just hundreds of those things. Right. Well, it's the power of also being able to galvanize people with music. So let me ask you one last question, and then you'll take the stage uh, fully. So oh, really, I don't know if I want to. I'm not ready. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Um, but I trust you. I trust you. I think you have a little experience. But one last question, I think that can relate to everyone here because we're all, you know, this coronavirus has really united humanity uh, and the best and the worst in humanity too. Now, um, one of the struggles has been to stay true to ourselves, to fulfilling our own unique purpose in life while facing the, this pandemic and the limits and um, maybe even the emotional limits that it creates. 
So how do you as an artist, and I think this is, by the way, and if, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe a constant struggle that, that exists in everyone's life, but particularly in the lives of artists, because you have this tremendous gift of God, this music that needs to erupt from within, yet you also have to deal with the daily challenges of life. So how do you maintain that healthy balance between continuing to fulfill your purpose and continuing to actualize your deepest self and your deepest gifts, yet still managing and somehow handling life's daily struggles and challenges? Well, I mean, I don't even know where to begin. You, you have a nice picture of the quote artist type. I would say like, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time you're, you know, looking at bills and picking up chicken from the store and I mean, like most of life is is just normal life um at least for me it is and when i'm working on something it's it's almost a break from that um and that continues it, it's been that way since i was a kid the other thing y you should know is that music or any kind of artwork almost anything that we do is not just this ephemeral emotional furry thing it is mostly architecture it's mostly structure it's mostly halacha if you will and without that you you are without the delivery system for this fuzzy emotional stuff this is like the architecture is like the body without the body which is rigid there is no home for the soul i mean these analogies i could go on i'm going to shut this ac off for a second. i could go on with those analogies for hours but in 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 having said that it's not really a, a challenge to switch between them you know they're kind of they synergize one another mm. i do know people you know artist types that like this one guy I knew was a songwriter and his wife was pregnant and he told his wife, he said, you know, I got to write songs for my next album and I have to, I'm going to go to Paris and write. And his wife likes, you know, I'm pregnant. I'm like, dude, can't you just write in the bedroom? What, what are you doing? In other words, the idea of being an artist first that's like, I'm an artist first and foremost. To me, because I'm very opinionated, you'll, you'll find that out soon enough. It's very wrong headed, one from a moral point of view, and even from an artistic point of view. If it's first and you feel like you're somehow absenting yourself from, from the vicissitudes of life or the, the normal challenges, you're trying to constantly transcend you're kind of missing the picture. The real artwork, in my opinion, comes from being a human being, from being a mensch. Slight digression here. I was getting into the Rebbe and talking about the Rebbe when I was, this is 30 years ago to somebody, smart, funny person. He says, yeah, but he's just a human being. And I said, I looked at him and I said, we know each other, right? He goes, yeah, I said, you and I are 99.9% .9 dog. If you are just a human being, you're like at, at an incredibly high level. Don't undermine the value of being a human being. So there's an art form in there, you know, striving for that. Right. Okay, that's beautiful. Thank you, Peter. That was very insightful. Are you ready for the stage? Well, let me plug in a continue couple of things. Converse, continue to speak. I can ask you about your, the new album of your father-in-law too. You, think <laughs> you know, I don't know much about it actually. Okay, but uh, the stage is yours. And then um, I encourage everyone that if you have any further questions for Peter, feel free to chat them and we'll try to relate to them at the end of his performance. But thank you again, Peter, really. Thank you for your insights and for your music. That's about to be sounded, by the way, on the best sound system I've heard so far on Zoom, and I've been on Zoom a lot. Special. How does it sound, you guys? How's the... 
Sounding good? I mean, Amazing. loud enough and everything? You know what I'm going to do? There's a song that I just wrote that I can't really remember the, the words to. I'm going to see if I'm going to pop it up here for a second. The guitar is starting to distort. It's starting to distort? Oh, yeah, thank you. Are you a sound guy or something? Yes. Oh, wow, I'm glad you're here. Thank you very much. What's your name? Lana? Sander. Oh, Sander that's, uh, that's it. How's this? Sorry. Is it still distorting? A little bit. Okay, I'm gonna fix it. Don't worry. It's gotta be right, and we got the right guy here to do it. Hmm, maybe I see what the problem is. Uh-huh. I'm gonna take that volume down. Sorry, everybody, but we've got a professional sound person here. Okay, hang on a second. We'll work with it. I brought the volume up earlier. How's this? Still distorting? Okay, we'll kick it down. Don't worry, everyone. We got this under control. In the meantime, I want to welcome really everybody. I also see my dear friend from Brazil, Manu Lafer. It's good to see you, Manu. And we have really people from across the world here. Well, that's great. It's probably Manu's also a musician. Good to see. You. Good to see this. See you, and good to listen to you, and good, and especially great to hear, listen to the music. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're just working it out, sir. This is for you, Manuel. Yeah. How is it now? Is it still distorted? If it is, then we got problems. What do you think? Yeah, is this? I I don't mind at all, but I'm, I'm wow. not. I'm just a uh, physician you, and, and songwriter. What do, you, <laughs> what do you think, Mr. Nassen? Still distorted? It is distorted, and it leaves you no headroom at all for dynamics. Yeah, that is not good. I don't know. You know, let me kill something here. You try something. You might just be fine with the vocal. Right? Yeah, yeah, maybe you're right. I'm going to just... But, but it's all right. It's all right. I think... Uh... No, you know what? It's just, it's not, not perfect. What if I just clip this and just go with a vocal mic? Try no, that. But no, don't kill the, music, the guitar. No, 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 I'm not. How's this? There we go. Just one simple mic like the old days, right? When you That's... shake your head like this, I'm like... Dude knows what he's talking about. That, that's as good as it's going to get right now. All right. So it's good. okay. And there I was bragging about the sound. <laughs> uh, that'll, get, that'll get you. The zoom is tricky. That's what got me started because you were bragging about it. I wanted to be right. Here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's this guy bragging? <laughs> All right. I'm going to play a song that I wrote. This is a uh, has theological overtones. Uh, good for it. happen here just continue it's zoom it's got to be perfect for you guys okay give me a thumbs up or down when you need me i stand beside you i'm there for you wherever you go when you're hungry i satisfy you that's the mission of my soul yeah 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 when you need confession I'm there to listen when you're crossing the ocean I gotta book the road when you need attention your audience won't be missing but that's the mission of my soul. Yeah, 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 I'll make your bed now When you're unsure 
I'm gonna let you go I said, baby, don't you trouble your head now But that's the mission of my soul Yeah, 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 yeah If you're a little girl and your name is Esther, it could be Esther, Esther Alouche. You're playing with some blue thing, I'm not sure what it is, but you're a pretty little lady, and man, that's the truth. Yeah, 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 yeah. making plans and you need a partner baby I'm your man just tell me when do we go you be my flower I'll be your gardener but that's the mission of my soul yeah Thank you, thank you. Special fancy Rabbi Alush ending there, as fancy as I could get. Oh, it's marvelous, <laughs> marvelous, Peter. Thank you, thank you. You have to, I have to hear before you move on to the second song. What the, what's the background of that song? Oh, you know, a lot of these songs that that actually make it into the pantheon, mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't really have a background. When I'll explain, it's like. If you sit down to write a song, or I really want to write a song about a young boy that is contemplating, you know, his existence under an oak tree. There's the, the song itself is going to be limited by all this circumscribed intellectualizing. The, the songs that work, which I think that one, at least for me, worked, it's so incredibly simple. Um, it just falls into your lap. It's not like a analytic or intellectual process. It's more like a, you know, right. you gear yourself up for it and here it comes. You know, you don't, you're gonna take dictation. They're not all like that, but, but that one I just probably just sat down. The first step to writing a song is sitting down. Right. With, with I, a piano yeah. or... I, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but you remind me, you know, the two types of psalms. There's a psalm that begins with Mizmor le David, and there's a psalm that begins with le David Mizmor, a song mm. to David, or David had a song. And they explain wow. exactly that, that a song to David means that the song just appeared to him. It was just that channel for that moment of inspiration. To David, a song, le David Mizmor, is when David actually had to sit down under an oak tree and compose... A song. Wow, I love that. That's nice. And interrupt any time if you're going to use that kind of stuff. If you got that kind of stuff, just interrupt me all the time. Here's a song I actually wrote in a car. How, Lana, how's it going? Still sound picking up the guitar nice enough? It's fine, right? Okay. car was moving, you know, somebody else was driving, I should say, but I was in the back. My roadie named Tom was driving. I said I'd call, well here I am, two years late, but oh my friend, I have grown since you knew me. There's a new blood running through me 
I'm in Chicago now, it's 5 p.m. There's a wind coming off Lake Michigan. It has no restriction. It has so much conviction. Well, I felt that way when I was nine or ten. I ain't felt the same a time again. And the wind's blowing strong Like it just can't wait no longer Like it has to make its way back home again Faded couches in TV set Motel bathroom soaking wet I wipe the steam from the mirror But my face it don't get no clear And the coke machine down the hall Sounds like thunder as the cans would fall like a thunder sound You can hear my heart pounding Like it has to make its way back home again Like it has to make its way back home again Thank you, Peter. Beautiful. Really. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Beautiful. Really. Okay, maybe you have one grand finale song for us. Oh, man. Grand finale song. Let me think what that could be. In the middle of a river there's a black and white pony Stuck out on a rock with the current rushing by The wind whips up and the sun beats down As a murder of crows bursts into the sky I got a lucid feeling like something inside me Is working up the courage to confront my own death so I step out in the water that's colder than anger So cold it feels impossible to take my next breath As I go under, I think about my mother I think about her hands just a stroke in my face I come out of the water, I look up at the sky I see swirls of red dust rising into space Keep your head raised up and press on Keep your head raised up and press on I gather up some matches and a pile of dry leaves I strike a couple matches and I finally make a fire I place some stones beside the flames and when the two are to touch, I feel my body filling with a strange desire. The beauty and the folly, the insipid, the enlightened, the sacred and insanely perverse. Flames start to flicker, sparks fly like devils. Sometimes I feel I was living in reverse. Where my youth ahead of me, clock slowing down Summers that stretch on for 16 years To have the kind of wonder I had at my bar mitzvah To feel my body filling with hope so clear 
Now keep your head raised up and press on. Keep your head raised up and press on. Put a mirror and bed, keep your head raised up and press on. Now I'm caught up in discovery, lost in simple sorrow, thinking clear-headed with no plan of any kind. An owl up in the treetops, hooting just for pleasure, singing long and low and out of his mind. If you were here with me, I suspect I'd be crying, crying like a child at the sound of your voice. Crying for joy and for loss and for love and all the many times I thought I had no choice. Well, I see I was mistaken to have believed in the measurements I'd taken of the world. I should have had more faith and a different imagination felt my confines lifting and my restrictions hurled. Are you ready? I keep your head raised up. And press on, sing it with me, people. Mind well, keep your head raised up. And press on, sing it in Spanish. Keep your head raised up. And press on, piano solo. <laughs> Praise God with me one time. Let's kneel in amazement and shiver at what's there to behold. Now take these wool blankets and warm yourself. Let's kneel together, just a world of the cold. Just a world of the cold. Now I just want to say, I see Hunter Anderson, Mindy Franklin, and Sue's pad. I see Amy Hunt, and she don't look bad. It's just a name on a screen, and you know what I mean. Karen Brodsky, whoo, she's a Jewish mitzvah machine. And let's not forget Manuel, and let's not forget my helper, Mr. Nassen. Keep your head raised up and press on. Your head raised up now and press on. Keep your head raised up and press on. Put the bear and bend a bit of it up, put the bear and bend a bit of it up. Thank you very much, y'all. That was amazing. Thank you, Peter. Thank you again. We can't thank you enough from the bottom of our, of our hearts. You should continue to inspire so many souls, ignite their fire within. 